Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sabobello Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Cram Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. It's a pleasure to be here, I think. Uh, thanks to you and Sabah for, for, uh, for organizing this and inviting to give your talk. Um, so I'll move on to the talk. I think, so, so I think when Sabah asked me whether I've been involved with any Delphi, I said, yeah, I've been involved with it. Although we didn't complete the Delphi, I said it's still ongoing, but it's a very sort of interesting methodology. And, uh, and, and one of our sort of common friend, uh, Dr. Srinu was ready in Chennai. I think he he has done a couple of Delphi's and I've, I've sort of been superficially involved with one of them. Um, so th that's sort of my experience in Delphi. But I think, um, so over the next sort of 20 minutes or so, we'll I'll try and make sure that I make sense about what, what we talk about Delphi. Um, so, I mean, so what I'll be talking about, I think first, first of all, let me, I mean, it's better to, I'm sure most of you know that Delphi is some sort of a consensus process, but but we'll try to read through the definition as well. And then I will present a paper, just sort of run through a paper so that you understand what a Delphi methodology is and, and explain a bit about where to use Delphi and how to use Delphi. That will be my sort of detailed explanation of the whole process. And then we'll look into the benefits, um, the limitations, and, and, uh, and then I'll give you some sort of uh, slides on what are the further readings that might be helpful to look at the Delphi. I think, I mean, uh, Sabah was talking about this earlier. I think, Lot, lots of Delphi projects are being done and, and published in good high impact journals. So I think it's a sort of good way of working on it. And I'll tell you what, what are the positives and what are the negatives over the next 20 minutes. So, so I think, to, so basically to define it, and as I said, it's a bit of a consensus. So what you're trying to do is you get opinions from a group of people. Uh, it's similar to MDT. I'll just compare it in the next uh, few, few minutes. Um, it's similar to an MDT where you're actually trying to get opinions from everyone. You refine that opinion and put a sort of a consensus uh, statement saying that, okay, this is the refined statement. The way, I mean, if you look at the history of how the Delphi came was actually because I think the, 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 the Greeks were able to sort of forecast what can happen in the future. And uh, this is, uh, in the, I'm sure you would have heard about the place Delphi in, in Greece. And there is this oracle uh, temple where they can actually predict the future. And Delphi is basically a methodology where you can actually take a consensus about what people think about and, and predict the future. And, and uh, the first publication of, on this came in from the, from the RAND company, which is, actually, which is actually a large company looking at the warfare uh, warfare technology in US and in 1969 what they did was they took consensus from all the experts to see uh, how many bombs Russia will actually need to 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 sort of make a big big impact in US that's how they they uh, that that's how it all started what we call as the RAND RAND forecast uh, and that was in 1969 so you're nearly talking about 50 years ago when this was all when this was all introduced the first paper came about now I think before I go more into explaining the Delphi I think it's important to understand why it is different from uh, an MDT I'm sure I think all of us would have sat through an MDT I think one of the one of the things that you would have seen is that I think the, the person who's actually presenting the case might actually bias the way people are answering. Um, if you present the case and you say that, oh, this is what I think should happen, you're automatically uh, creating what we call as a anchoring bias or a first speaker advantage where you're saying that, okay, this is what should happen because let's say I have looked at the scans or I have looked at the blood results or I have seen the patient. So you're automatically creating a bias there. Um, and similarly, I think, I mean, I'm sure you would have sat through an MDT where you would have seen that there are some people who are really authoritative, either because of their experience or, or maybe that's how they talk or, or people see that, wow, they're really smart and they always come up with some smart opinions and you will have this, uh, this hollow bias where you think that, oh, they, they say it's going to be right. So that's how we, we perceive at times. And, and, and also when, when sometimes when people, when people have already given an opinion in an MDT, let's say I'm, I'm the surgeon who's looking at um, somebody who needs a liver resection. I've said like, oh, I've looked at, I've looked at it in detail. And then they say, oh, it needs an operation. 
and I don't really change my um, um, because I, on a second thought, I might think maybe maybe it is not indicated, but I don't change change my views uh, at the at, at sort of at the next thought because I feel that if I say no now, people might think that um, this guy is not very reliable because he said yes and then he suddenly said no. So you're worried about whether you've lost the face in front of an MDT. So these are the risks that we we always see in a multidisciplinary team meeting, which which you don't realize. And we we do this we do this uh, every every day. And there are there are there are lots of negatives of having an MDT meeting. And and at the same time, when I say about authoritative face, there are also people who don't talk in the talk in the MDT. They don't come across uh, come across well, or or their opinion they don't they don't they don't put it forward. So these are these are the negatives. So let me take you through a paper. I mean, this is actually a paper where they where they wanted to put in a, a curriculum uh, where a general surgery resident we don't know how much they actually need to know about hepatobiliary surgery, and that was the that was the question because lots of general surgery residents when they go into a higher surgical training or a fellowship in HPV, uh, they don't seem to have enough experience of HP, hepatobiliary surgery. So this is this was this was the problem. And they wanted to find out what can be done and in terms of whether we can actually lay a consensus uh, document where you can actually put in a curriculum. I mean, obviously, to do that, the best way would be like having an MDT where you get experts from all around the world, arrange, arrange a conference and sit together and discuss. But is it that easy? It's not that easy because you you'll have to spend a lot of money to bring your experts uh, uh, from across the world to sit together. That is where the Delphi process is unique because you, you actually don't need to do anything physically at all. It all it's all done virtually. Uh, and their questions are basically how much the general surgery residents need to do or know, because that's going to impact on what will be their, uh, uh, how, how well will, will they be trained in on-call and emergency general surgery work, and how well will they be prepared to take on a fellowship. Basically, they went about this thing, the, the question they had, by taking an inter international uh, expert consensus. So I'm sure I'm sure some of the general surgical trainees on 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 this meeting would have would have would, would be using the ISCP, and and you would have seen the how the curriculum project is laid and it says like okay people need to know about liver trauma, but uh, but it also says in the bracket that it's it's only for specialists so it doesn't really tell you but this consensus document has not been actually put together through a Delphi process. It's probably an MDT process where people have written the curriculum and people have sort of said, okay, it looks fine, but but it's not gone through a Delphi consensus at all. So what did the what did they actually do? The 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 people who actually tried to put in a curriculum for a HPV surgery, they initially did a literature search because they wanted to know what is there in the literature for a hepatobiliary curriculum around, around the world. Um, so they did a Prisma guideline, similar to what you do for a systematic search. So if you look at the previous slide, where I was telling you that this is the by means of a modified Delphi methodology, they used a modified Delphi methodology. So what is the difference between a modified Delphi and a, and a conventional Delphi is that in a conventional Delphi, what you do is that you, you, you in the first stage, in the first step of the process, you sit with a panel and you discuss the questions you sit with the experts you you put in a put in a questions and then you take it further whereas in a modified delphi the first process is very cumbersome they don't do that they basically just do the literature search uh, a group of people who want to do the study do the literature search and then invite the experts for further rounds of questions so that is the difference between a modified delphi because a modified delphi is much more easier than a conventional delphi i'll go into a bit more detail a bit later on so first thing is to do the literature search. If you look at the sort of the chart on the right side, they did the literature review, and then you design your initial questionnaire. This initial questionnaire will ask about sort of various various questions. I mean, should people be doing liver trauma? Should people be learning about the anatomy of the liver trauma, anatomy of the liver in detail? And then you do the round one, uh, and then round two, finding the experts, inviting the experts, asking them to look at these questions, and then identifying whether the experts agree on this. So you, in the end, you what you try to do is you try to reach consensus. I'll sort of go into a bit more detail. So what they did was, then you start recruiting the experts and, and you have to define who the experts are gonna be. They define who the experts will be that they need to have at least a minimum of 100 hepatobiliary procedures and, and at least do about 20 major uh, liver surgeries annually. And, and for this study, what they wanted to do is that they clearly 
mentioned where the experts are going to come from, the sort of the mixture of Asia, Europe and America, so that you have a wide variety of experts. And that's very important. I think you need to have a diverse variety of experts. You can look at various training needs across the world, and that will also tell you uh, what needs to happen in the UK when compared to what is happening in the Asia or the or the America if you are doing an ISCP for the, for the UK trainees. So in total, they actually sent 52 invitations and, and uh, nine of them, uh, sorry, 11 of them did not respond and they included 41 experts from various different centers, uh, centers across the world. It's very important. So once you define, once you identify the experts, then you send the questions, you frame the questions, you, you check the questions within your facilitator panel, and then you send it across to the experts and the experts look through the questions and, and try to identify what they agree on, what they do not agree on. And you give them a specific timelines to, to answer questions and, and you give them reminders and you need to set up sort of uh, timelines for when, what if they don't respond, how do you actually get the responses back again? And here, what they did was they also have to define what will be the consensus because let's say there are 41 experts, you need to have at least about 32 experts that 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 uh, should have agreed on agreed on it so if you have an agreement on a question for example if the question says that they need to have a knowledge on liver uh, liver liver anatomy and 80 percentage of the experts agree on it then that means that the question has been validated you don't need to have a hundred percent hundred percent agreement and 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 you can do some statistics as well i'll sort of go into a bit more detail about it later on so what they did was they put forward the questions and uh, and and in in round one about 41 41 experts saw the questions there were about nine initially they had 101 questions by the time it came to round one they had 90 items and uh, and and you can see that by the time they went to round two there were some more suggestions from the from the experts and it went to uh, the number of items went to 96 items and then by the time it came to round three, there were 94 items and two were, I mean, you remove the items where either uh, the, 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 you feel that, the, that, that it won't reach consensus because there is a problem with the, with the question, or if the experts feel that these are not the right questions to be included, then you, you remove them. You basically edit the questions based on the responses from the experts. And then you finally reach consensus uh, based on at least eighty percentage of the experts should have agreed on that uh, on that question on that on on the question. So this this these were the results from the study. So if you look at the they had sort of four domains: knowledge questions, I think knowledge of biliary tract anatomy, including gallbladder, and they looked at the median interquartile range on a Likert scale, and hundred percentage had consensus. So they included that question into the into the curriculum. Similarly, technical skills they had questions. Similarly, attitude statements, they had questions which agreed on and then they included it. And then the post-operative care statements. There are some questions where they excluded it because you can see that they had to exclude them on the first round itself because there was a lot of comment regarding this question where the expert felt that they should not, they should not go, through, go through for the next round or the panel feels that, okay, this is not going to reach consensus and this is not the right question and and uh, that's because the experts have actually given some free text on it I'll, I'll go a bit more detail about explaining each and everything a bit later on but you exclude some of them as well so now coming into where is actually the delphi method is useful is when you have to develop some priorities so it's a qualitative method it's not a quantitative method so it's not really scientific because you're looking at opinions from the patient and you can develop policies, you can de decision make. And so if you look at some of these examples, I think if you look at the, the top one, a modified Delphi, Delphi method towards multidisciplinary consensus or functional convalescence recommendations after. So there are some recommendations that have been developed, developed after abdominal surgery. Here, you're actually trying to develop some priorities, what should happen in, for recovery after abdominal surgery. Similarly, there is an objective assessment. You're developing a rating scale for objective assessment in laparoscopic uh, appendicectomy. And if you look at the third example, you're actually trying to see where is the genetic medicine is actually heading. That is like predicting the future, what is going to happen to the future of uh, genetic genetic medicine. And, and, and the bottom, the other one, the cure project is actually where you're actually trying to implement a strategy and develop a policy. So you are, you are actually getting an opinions from the experts 
and then and then putting through a consensus document if there are no expertise then definitely this is not going to work for example let's say you have only a couple of set uh, sentences in the world who do uh, some some machine perfusion of a liver and and if that is the case if there's no expertise on it then it, it is not, never going to work and similarly if there is no evolution of something for example if they have machine perfusion in various centers but if it is not progressing if the same thing is happening for the last 10 years then even if you ask any questions you're not going to predict any future or you're not going to forecast a future or make any policies because nothing has changed in that in that particular field so it's not going to be very useful again where it's not going to be useful i think it is a very time consuming process so in terms of the evidence base it is it is an expert opinion so it's at the bottom of the pyramid so it's not the best of the the whole technique that can uh, that you can use it's a, it's a highly qualitative method not a not a quantitative method so just to sort of recap on the process what you do is that the first thing you identify what is the problem so they identified that the problem is they don't have a curriculum for a hepatobiliary surgery and the person who identifies the problem is the facilitator and you have a panel of facilitators you have a group of people who will help you you can imagine i think when you put in a lot of questions it has to come back it, you need to send it to the experts so let's say you identify 10 experts in the world it goes to the experts and then the expert, experts respond to them and if you have like 100 questions and expert respond to the 100 questions you can imagine the amount of work that it will create so you need to have some sort of a coordinator with you who can actually help through and 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 sort of see through pro, see through things and do a lot of coordinating work so it's a very time consuming process so you need to the facilitator will also be helped by uh, by by coordinators or somebody who can actually do that sort of a uh, administration work then you identify the experts you pass it on to the experts and it goes to a lot of iterative process where you identify what the experts are saying and then you remove the questions or you add questions or or you change the questions based on that and then it goes through the experts again so you do this multiple number of times and then you finally get consensus and then finally prepare prepare the report so i think i'll sort of go into a bit bit more detail on on the selection of experts so the, the suggestion from there is actually no universal guideline for doing a Delphi process. So although the Delphi process is actually something that re reaches consensus, there are no, there are no universal, universal guidelines for it. They say that you should at least have about uh, 8 to 12 uh, experts. More importantly, they should be knowledgeable about what, what you're doing. And, and uh, you, you need to make sure that they have a good, a good amount of experience in it. And there are some there are some places where you might not get two experts, where you might actually get uh, people who have some, some information and some idea regarding this, but you might not, they might not be experts. But it's always important to get the breadth of expertise. So if you look at the, the, the curriculum project, they actually included not only the, the, the surgeons uh, across, across the sort of the centers, but also included some of the trainees, they included people who are attendees, they included people who are professors. So they included a wide variety of people, some from the academic centers, some from the teaching centers, because it's the diversity of views that will tell you whether everything has been included, every, every problem has been looked at when the questions come across. So that, that's very important to think about. And when you initially frame the questions, you need uh, identify the experts. When you email them, you need to let, let them at least two weeks to decide whether they want to participate or not. And you need to tell them that their names will be confidential because when the expert respond back with the, with the answer after you have sent them the questionnaire, they won't be identified by anyone else. That's the most important thing about the whole Delphi process because it's completely an anonymous process and it's blinded. And that's what makes it, uh, makes it strong because if somebody, I mean, if you, if you, again, if you look at the parallel from the MDD, the problem, the reason why people sort of get biased is because somebody has been uh, somebody, somebody who is really dominant tells them what to do and people don't change their answer. Whereas here you're sitting, you, the experts are sitting in various places and they're answering and it's all anonymous and people don't see who was answered. So they don't really know, know what is the other people's view. So you just give your own views and you don't you can actually i mean when you when 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 they come back again to the iterative process for example round 2 you say okay i have agreed to this question there should be anatomy included 
in round two, you don't agree, you don't believe in it, then you can change it to a no. So nobody's identifying whether you change it to yes or no, because that's 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 the basic sort of uh, sort of the importance of the whole Delphi process that you can actually change your answers. So you you don't you don't need to stick to your answers at all. So when people are facilitating this, so because it's all done online, it's a blinded process, you need to give a very clear information sheet to the experts and, and it has to be uniform. All experts should get the same information sheet and, and because, because for example, if the, if, the, if the questions are not framed properly, that can lead to a lot of problems. So you, your questions and your instructions, for example, your first round question will be something like, um, what do you think so what do you think residents need to learn about hepatobiliary surgery like a very open ended question or you won't give options you will give them an, a free text box to answer the answer answer the question and you need to really clearly say that this is a free text box and try to fill all the five five text boxes if you don't give that information to the to the to the experts then they won't fill it and you won't get adequate information and it's very important also to stick to the timelines you need to tell them that you, you will have to respond to each round of questions within a certain period of time, within four weeks time. And if you don't respond, then, then that delays the whole process. And, and again, you need to set up a timeline when the reminders will be sent. For example, in the HPV study, in the hepatobiliary study, they said that, that it will be four weeks for them to answer. And there will be four emails that will be sent across. If they don't answer, then, then, then probably the experts will drop out. So, um, so in some studies, they also use the phone contact to make sure that you call them again to remind them so that there is no, there is no dropouts because the more the experts drop out, then the whole validity of the internal validity of the study goes down. And, and I think in the first round, uh, you need to have a free text box because, because you can imagine, I think if the, if the facilitators are actually preparing the questions, you're automatically introducing a bias there. So you need to try and avoid that bias. And, and the way you can avoid that bias is doing the actual Delphi uh, methodology, the conventional Delphi rather than the rather than the modified Delphi. Because if you do a conventional Delphi, you can bring everything, everybody together. You can you can sit together and then prepare those questions, and then and then start the process. And and again, as I said, the most important thing about the Delphi is that they can actually you can modify the statements. First round, you send a statement, and you feel that based on the responses you get, the statements are not right. Then you can modify the modify the statements, and then you can actually propose additional items. You can remove statements um, based on what what the responses are, um, and and clearly define what will be your inclusion and exclusion criteria for for this uh, round. So again, round one needs to be a clear cut, open ended questions. Um, it, this is where you actually generate a lot of ideas, and and keep it to a limited number of questions. So because you round one, you cannot have a huge number of questions. You want to keep it to a limited number of questions so that you generate a lot of ideas. For example, as, as I said, a broad question asking, what do, the, what do you think they need to know in terms of the knowledge? Then you can ask, what do you think they need to know in terms of the technique? Then you can ask, what do you think they need to know in terms of the post-operative care for HPV surgery? And then you can actually pilot this as well to find out whether this is all working well. You can send it to, a, send it to let's say, five experts you identify who are not included in the final study. And then, and then, and then you can modify the questions because some questions might not be very clear in the first go. So, so that's very important. I think the most important thing, like like anything that you do in research, uh, if you if your first questions are not right, like if you if you put garbage in, then garbage out. I'm sure you would have heard about this. And and your questions needs to be very clear, not vague and ambiguous in the first round. And and. So you can imagine when you put around one questions where you're leaving a lot of free text boxes, you will get a large amount of data. You'll get a large amount of qualitative data and it will be hugely worded because some people might be writing sentences to explain each and everything. Um, and, 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 and then you have to sit together and, and within your panel, which is the facilitator panel, and then group, to, group them together. You can use... Uh, on the left side, you can see the affinity diagram where you can actually identify specific domains and then and then group them in it. So I was speaking to Dr. Reddy, who has done this project on um, on, on identifying liver transplant for patients who have rat, rat killer poisoning. And, and he was telling me that they identified sort of the initial questions. And then and then they felt that probably you should have surgeons answering a specific part of the questions 
for this problem. So for example, if you have a risk score, then you can identify an asset is probably will answer this particular question. Uh, surgeons should answer this question because, because if you ask questions about echo, surgeons might not, not, not actually have a, have a good answer to it. So you need to be able to pick up domains or pick up sort of, you, you should be able to substratify these, these into different uh, different questions. You need to have some affinity diagrams. And similarly, you can, you can identify the problem and then do this sort of fish bone structure where you identify each and every structure and, and, and be able to put them together into separate questions. So this is a lot of work. That's why I was saying that until you need a Delphi, don't do a Delphi because it is, it is very time consuming and it, and it takes a lot of, lot of time. Um, then when you come to, so after you've had those open-ended questions, let's say you have sent 10 open-ended questions and then you group them together. Now you can actually put forward from 10, you will end up with 50 questions because now you have a bit more clarity on what questions to ask. It can be sort of, it has to be a close-ended question because that will help you to um, one ask, you can ask directly an SN, yes or no question. So you can ask, should they be confident in doing a liver trauma? Yes or no. You can ask something like that, or you can have a rating scale, like Likert scale, where you have Likert scale, or or you sort of, sort of strongly disagree to a strongly agree, like uh, like I mean, similarly like a Likert scale. You can ask that. So then you go into a sort of a lot of iteration where you do round two, then you 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 get answers from them. Let's say from round two, uh, about thirty percentage of those questions have reached consensus. To to have a consensus you should have already thought about what will be your consensus percentage. So they say that an agreement will be at least if you if 51 percentage or, or up to about 80 percentage of people agree on that. But ideally, people say that you should have at least about 80 percentage consensus before you can agree on that statement. So 80 percentage of people, experts should agree on it. And this needs to be decided well before the data, data well before the questions are sent to the panel. And in a categorical data, let's say an essay or no question, you are thinking in terms of percentage agreement. For a continuous data like a Likert scale, you use a median score for the Likert, but it's the interquartile range that actually makes a difference because if there is no difference between the experts and your interquartile range is less than or equal to one, then you note that they are all sort of agreeing and they all score five on the Likert scale. Then, then that's how you actually reach consensus. So based on the inquiry lane. And round two, once you get the round two, then you gather it, you sit together, you prepare the questions, and then you analyze, and then you go back again to round two. So you do this multiple times until you reach your, your consensus for all the questions. So the most important thing at, at, at this point of time, at each round, it's important to, if you, if you see the table below, this is just an example, you need to tell them what was their response in round two, what was the response of the group in round two, and then you need to give them an option that they can change their response because people might change their response based on what the whole iterative group, sort of ex expert lot are thinking. And and obviously people, I think that is that is the chance you give them to change the response. That is the difference between, uh, let's say, an MDT, the face value thing, where people are not keen to change the response, to actually letting them to change the response and, and allow chance to respond. And I think some people say that the, the questions that have already reached consensus should be taken out because what is happening here is, let's say they started with 90. I mean, if you look at the HPB project, they started with 101, then it went to 90, then 96. So the problem of keeping all the questions again for the further rounds is you're actually giving them again a huge number of questions, huge number of time to actually go through that and a lot of time consuming. And there is a risk that the number of times they answer this, they might actually not answer it properly. So there is a risk that you're not going to get uh, right answers again. So people say that you should actually remove once you've already reached consensus at a certain stage. At, let's say round three, you've reached consensus on 40 out of 50 questions, then people say that you should remove them at that stage, but it's very, it's very controversial, but it makes sense that if you look at it on one way that uh, people don't want to really keep answering the same thing again and again, uh, because, because it's time consuming and you will have expert dropout. So overall, in terms of the analysis, I think, as I said, it's a qualitative analysis. You, you analyze the open-ended questions, but you also have the sort of quantitative analysis when you go into round two, round three, and subsequent rounds. Um, you calculate the consensus, you calculate the ratings, and then you can actually rank the responses based, based on the consensus achieved. 
as I said, the interquantile range is the most important thing because that tells you how close you're not trying to find out whether your questions, the experts agree on your questions. You're trying to find out whether the experts agree on that the, the, the topic of that question. If you understand what I'm trying to say, whether the experts agree, whether the whether the surgeons, the, the, the general surgery residents should be confident in doing liver trauma rather than, rather than the question, the way you frame the question. They should be able to understand, they should be able to come closer to consensus on the, 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 the topic that we are talking about rather than the actual question. So, so that's the whole thing about the process of uh, Delphi. So you just keep going until you reach consensus. Once you reach consensus, then you write a report, you you tell you you send it to the experts, make sure that they are involved, and then you publish you publish the consensus. So I think the benefit is basically it removes the problems of the focus groups like dominant personalities, the pressure, the group pressure that can that can come, and also the noise that happens when people are uh, digressing in a in an MDT, talking about lots of other things, which can actually confuse people in making decisions. And, and you, you use a huge amount of experts around the world because it's all done in an anonymous manner. It completely removes the bias that can happen. But, but obviously there is some bias in it because if you give them chances to change their question, like a, telling them what the experts, uh, what, the, what the group thinks and what they've done previously and then chance to change, it does introduce bias because, but, but what it doesn't tell you, tell them is who has actually made the decision. They don't get to know that. So it's all completely anonymous and it removes the perception um, from what, what others think. Obviously there are lots of limitations. Some of them I've actually covered before. It takes a long time to reach consensus. So you will have uh, the expert dropout. This is where you need to keep them motivated by frequent emails and avoid delays in the process. So if you say like somebody is not responding, you cannot really keep going with it. And also your processes, your processes of synthesizing the data should be done in time so that you don't lose experts. And, and you need to prepare high quality reports, which doesn't conflict the next question or which doesn't cause confusion. So you don't, you avoid the garbage and garbage of problems. And, uh, and, and I think, I mean, none of the questions should actually introduce bias. So that's where having the initial focus group meeting, having the initial inter interview might actually help you to sort of frame the questions well. And, and also having a diverse group of people will, will help, will help because if you have general surgery residents thinking about their own curriculum rather than somebody else senior laying the curriculum, it will help as well for them to understand what they should, what they should do. Um, obviously, as I said, it's all very subjective because you're talking about opinions. So the level of evidence is very less and, uh, and the internal validity of this is largely unknown. So, but it's all completely opinion, opinion based. So these are some of the things that you can read. There's a very good book I, uh, I've sort of looked into when I was doing, when, when we started a research project on machine profession, which we are currently doing, where we have reached about uh, sort of um, round, round four at the moment, and it's going through a lot of iteration. And, and you can also look into some of the checklists that is available on doing, doing Delphi, Delphi and the sort of link for the project that I, that I spoke. And there's one sort of YouTube video, which I found very, very useful uh, preparing this talk as well, I think, which you can look at. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.